Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the fourth session of Canada SDA's Health Team Symposium, Healthy Brain, Broken Brain. Um, it's presented by Dr. Barry Wecker. And before I get into the introduction, just a few housekeeping items. First, um, we have some light refreshments, some water, some juice. So um, if you get thirsty, you dry throat, please ask the greeter. We'll get you one, and please join us after. Also, make sure you join us next Saturday. That is our Sabbath at 11 o'clock. Um, because after that, we'll be having lunch, potluck lunch. And the good thing is that's provided by the church. You don't have to bring anything. So please join us. You don't want to miss out. We want to look for it and just fellowship with you, get to, to know you and find out how you're liking the, the session. So please make sure that you join us. So um, if you haven't received one of these cards, please take one. Because tonight, as I said before, it is the... Uh, uh, the gut-brain connection and freedom to love. That's what's occurring tonight. Um, tomorrow night is depression and anxiety, the battle between love and fear. Tuesday, we have dementia and Alzheimer's disease and the two operating system. Wednesday night is off, and then back on Thursday, we'll be discussing ADD, ADHD, and autism spectrum disorder, uh, there is no need to be afraid of God. Friday evening, boost your immune system. Uh, life more abundant. And we could all do with more abundant life, couldn't we? And then next Saturday at 11, it's the original glory and glory restored. And then at 4 o'clock, the very last session, eight steps to a tremendous brain and healthy picture of God. So please... Um, if you can, come out for all those sessions. And if not, if there's one of those sessions that you really want to attend, please make sure you attend it. So I've been given the honor of introducing Dr. Barry Wecker, who has so far been providing an excellent presentation for the past uh, three sessions. And uh, Dr. Barry Wecker, he's been practicing medicine for the past 46 years. 35 of those years has been in the great province of New Brunswick. Uh, Dr. Wecker enjoys um, uh, being active, running, hiking. He also enjoys uh, playing tennis, and he's done scuba diving. So all things that lead and enhance a life, being active, body, mind, and spirit. So following tonight's uh, uh, presentation, if you have any questions, uh, there'll be a Q&A. And then if you have any one-on-one -on -one questions of a personal nature, Dr. Barry Reck will, will be um, available just to answer it briefly. So please um, join me in welcoming Dr. Barry Wecker. So tonight we're gonna to be talking about the gut-brain connection. This is a new area of understanding, a new area of medicine. And it's one that is expanding and growing exponentially. There's research coming out about it, and it's extremely exciting. So the first thing I want to say is that we frequently have, especially in the past two and a half years, a very negative picture of germs, right? Especially coronaviruses. Um, so... Um, we have microbes of all sorts of types. And um, the reason we're afraid of them is because we think that they all cause disease. But that's a very erroneous concept. From the moment we're born, we live in a symbiosis with billions of microbes. And they number more than 10 times the cells that we have in our own bodies. And their weight totally is greater than the weight of our brain. So in order to sort of illustrate this cohabitation, we can compare our body to the earth and the microbes to the living organisms that fill the earth. Each population has an ecosystem, 
and a favorable habitat, just as certain animals prefer to love, live in the desert, others in the sea. In the same way, we find microorganisms in all the corners of our bodies. We find them in our skin, on our skin, in our mouth, in our ears, our eyes, our lungs, our bronchi, in our reproductive tracts, and in our digestive tract. So tonight I want to talk about some of these new terms that we're coming to, and that you're going to hear more about, undoubtedly, in the future. So the first of all, we have the word microbe. And these microbes refer to what we see on the screen here. We have, this looks like a coronavirus there. Um, we've got protozoa, things that are parasites. We've got uh, bacteria. We've got... Uh, fungi, we've got a whole bunch of microorganisms that can infect and cohabitate with our body. So, um, the first concept that I want to bring up is that of what we call the microbiome. And the microbiome means the total of all the microbes that live inside and outside of our bodies. And, um, and this microbiome is very important for our health. So we have, here's our microbiome. As I said, bacteria, viruses, parasites, fungi. Then we have the microflora. And this is um, Another word that describes the total of all the microbes, okay? It's the, nu the numbers, the names of all these microbes. We have the microbiota, which is the microbes that live in one organ, and, or one organism even. And then we have the, once again, the microbiome, all the microbes living in, in and on the body. So a bunch of names that are somewhat interchangeable, and I wouldn't worry about learning the difference between those because we use the word microbiome generally. So here's some of them again, fungi, bacteria, archaea, which is another type of microbe, viruses, and um, they make up our microbiome. The human microbiome represents billions of these microorganisms. They live on our skin, as I mentioned. They live in our digestive tract, on our mucous membranes. We estimate that there are between 75 and 200 billion of these microbes that live in us and on us. The microbiome has 10 times the number of cells that our own body does. In just the mouth alone, there can be over 300 types of bacteria. And interestingly enough, if a person gets bit by a dog, we always say there's a 10% chance of getting an infected wound. If you get bit by a cat, it's 50%. If you get bit by a human being, it's 100% infection. So if somebody tells you you have a dirty mouth, take it as a compliment. The metagenome is the um, sum total of the ge genetic material of all these bacteria, microbiome, and ourselves. So all of the genetic material in the organism is called the metagenome. And there's a hundred times more genes in the bacteria and microbes than there is in our own bodies. Okay? So we depend on the genetic material of all these microbes, of this whole microbiota. We've often thought that... Um, that these microbes cause disease. But really, disease-causing bacteria are only a very small number. Of the tens of thousands of bacteria known in the world today, there are probably only a hundred that cause disease. Now, scientists are shifting from studying those that cause disease to those that promote health. And that's very interesting. 
Um, so before I move on here, these are some of the areas where these, um, where these microbes live, nose, mouth, skin, gut, genital tract. And um, same thing that I mentioned, 75 to 200 billion organisms, 10 times more than the cells in our body. Um, various different areas. And th this slide is kind of interesting because in the nose, these microbes stimulate mucus production, which are part of the defense mechanism of the nose. Um, in the mouth, they assist in the digestion of food and they, war they take away some of the pathogens. In the mouth, the lungs, they lubricate the pulmonary tissues and they're involved with the health of the lungs and the respiratory tract um, and so on as we go down. And on the skin, some of the bacteria on the skin help our immune system. And we have discovered that there are bacteria that live on our skin that are important for our mood stability. And if we are using antibacterial soaps on a regular basis, because we're germaphobes, we can actually cause depression from that. Interesting, interesting stuff. We'll come to more of that. So scientists have known for years um, that, that bacteria play an important role in our health. Um, most play a positive role. Some play a negative role and cause disease. Um, and as I said, we're now shifting our focus on bacteria from the disease-causing ones to the health-promoting ones. We know that certain bacteria help protect us from diseases caused by bad bacteria. Sometimes they take the place of all the bad bacteria. So if we give a person an antibiotic, and I hope I don't have any dentists in the room, but the dentists are big promoters of a particular antibiotic called clindamycin. And every time I get a patient coming in after having been to the dentist who has taken clindamycin, I start shuddering because the clindamycin kills off all the good bacteria and these people ultimately end up with diarrhea and what we call pseudomembranous colitis that's caused by a bacterium that causes disease called Clostridium difficile. And that, you can be extremely sick with this disease. And unfortunately, it spreads very rapidly in hospitals. And so if someone comes in the hospital with C. difficile, we have to put them in isolation. You got a gown and glove and mask to go into a room with them and we have you know, negative air pressures and everything because it can spread through hospitals terribly fast. So the bacteria, the healthy bacteria protect us from these disease-causing bacteria. So any change in our microbiome can cause disease. Now, a very interesting study was done. We took people who live in a very rural part of Japan and we studied their microbiome. And these people, they live in one of the blue zones of the world where they live to be 100 and 110 years old. So we studied their microbiome. We studied all the bacteria that live in their intestinal tracts. And then we did the same thing for people who have moved from this rural part of Japan to Tokyo. And we found that their microbiome was totally different but they no longer live to be 110 years old either. And then we took the Japanese that have moved from Tokyo to Vancouver, and their bio microbiome is totally different, and they die the same age as all the rest of us Canadians. So we found out, we gathered from that, that this microbiome was what was giving them longevity. So that started a very, very interesting set of studies. We do know that Crohn's disease, now Crohn's disease is a type of colitis of the small bowel, and it's a very serious disease. Most people who end up with Crohn's disease lose several meters of their small intestine. And I have 10 patients with Crohn's disease, 
and they're very sick, and most of them have been unwilling to follow through with some of the advice that I'm, you're going to be getting from me later on this evening. Now, a very interesting thing about Crohn's disease is there's been a very revolutionary treatment for Crohn's disease that's still under research, and we haven't approved it by a health protection branch, but we're doing feces transplantation, so we actually take capsules of stool from healthy people with a healthy microbiome, and we give it to these people with Crohn's disease, and we recolonize their intestinal tract with healthy bacteria, and we've got the best results for curing Crohn's disease so far. The problem is, is we don't know how to standardize it, make sure we're not transmitting other diseases from it, and of course the whole idea makes us all just shudder to begin with. Um, but some of the diseases that we're seeing are related to the microbiome is this one. We're finding out that the weight problem can be related to the microbiome. We're also finding out that we have some other ones, like this one. Diabetes is related to our microbiome. And we're now exploring possibilities of changing the, the whole diabetes program, which is epidemic in Canada, by alterations in our microbiome. Um, we also have, as I mentioned, colitis, inflammations of the bowel, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. They're all related to microbiome changes. We mentioned C. difficile or pseudomembranous colitis, another type of bowel inflammation. It's very much related to um, changes in our uh, microbiome. We have cancer of the colon. Now, many long years ago, probably 75 years ago, there was a Dr. Burkett who worked in West Africa, and he discovered that West Africans had a very low incidence of cancer of the colon. And so he did some research, and he figured out that it was because they had a very high fiber, largely plant-based diet in West Africa. They didn't eat a lot of meat, and so therefore he proposed that it was this plant-based diet that prevented them from getting cancer of the colon. We now know that that's part of it, but the other part of it is the microbiome again. What we eat determines the microbiome, and we're going to be coming to that. We also have um, liver disease, which is microbiome-related. We have depression, which is microbiome-related. And so it becomes very important to us that we need to take care of our microbiome. So when the microbiome becomes unbalanced, we call it a DYS, D -Y -S, which means disturbed or abnormal biosis, an abnormal amount of life in our being. And um, so science is now showing us that this intestinal microbiota does several things. It helps the digestion of our food. It produces certain vitamins, like vitamin B and vitamin K. It produces antioxidants. Now, how much are you familiar with antioxidants? You know what happens if you take a piece of iron and you set it outside in your yard? What happens to it? If you set a piece of iron, what's going to happen in a year? It's going to be rusty, OK? Rusty is oxidation. And so we, too, oxidate. We get rusty. And that's what causes disease. So antioxidants are certain elements in our diet that prevent us from rusting. So if you have a piece of metal and you want to prevent it from rusting, what kind of metal works better? Iron or what? Stainless steel, you bet, okay? Or galvanized metal. And that's because we turn this into, we have an antioxidant capacity in there. So we need to be having antioxidants to get rid of all the rust in our organs and bodies as well. And we will come to that a little bit more as well. So science is showing us that these are major factors and um, 
And anything that disturbs this microbiome causes disease. So what are the sort of things that disturb it? Well, very interestingly enough, it starts from the time we're born. Because the first inoculation of bacteria into our bodies comes during passage through the birth canal. So what do we do now that 50% of our babies are born by cesarean section? Major problem. Some people are recommending that when a cesarean section is necessary, that we take a piece of gauze and we put it inside the lady's birth canal, and when the baby's born, we put that gauze over the baby's face so the baby gets inoculated with the mother's birth or birthing bacterial content, which, believe it or not, is specifically geared to that baby's health and well-being. So we need to be looking at this whole fact of 50% of our babies being born by cesarean section. Another thing that happens is whether we breastfeed or not. Because around, a, on a woman's breast are bacteria that are once again specifically designed for that child, her child. And so if the mother breastfeeds, this puts healthy bacteria into the intestinal tract of that child. Then the other problem comes into my department, and that is mom brings the kid in and he's got an earache. And so what's my first tendency to do? Prescribe an antibiotic. And we give far too many antibiotics. And these antibiotics destroy our healthy bacteria. And so as time has gone by, the numbers of, back, of antibiotics that I prescribe have decreased by 50 times. I rarely prescribe an antibiotic, and I have to be very, very sure of several things. Number one, that I know it's caused by a bacterium, not a virus. I need to know that the disease needs to be stopped and that which specific antibiotic I need to use it. So it becomes the responsibility of the physician, and I will say the patient as well, to be a responsible antibiotic user. The other day, I got into a little bit of a problem with one of my colleagues because I saw one of my patients in the, in the walk-in clinic, and um, I called the patient over and said, what are you here for? And the lady said, well, I think my daughter has a urinary tract infection. I said, okay. I said, let me just give you a piece of advice. Don't take an antibiotic unless you get a positive urine culture. My colleague overheard me say that, and she got furious. She came screaming down the hall at me and telling me that I was interfering with her care and I didn't trust her care and I could take care of these patients myself. And, uh, and I just said, I'm sorry. I was just reaffirming to this patient to be a responsible person when it comes to the use of antibiotics. Well, as it turned out, the little girl did not have a urinary tract infection. She had worms. And so once we cleared the pinworms, the symptoms of the urinary tract infection disappeared. But had I not said that, I virtually guarantee you she would have received an antibiotic. Okay? So antibiotics are, you know, the breakthrough of antibiotics is tremendous. My mother got pneumonia when she was 18 years old here in Ontario. It turned into what we call an empyema, which is a pus and infection all through the chest cavity. She was hospitalized in Toronto for a long, long time with chest tubes. She weighed about 40 kilos, and everyone expected her to die. It was World War II time, 
And penicillin had been discovered by Alexander Fleming in 1939, which was the beginning of the war, but penicillin was reserved for the military because during World War I, more soldiers died from infectious diseases than died from gunshots. So the Canadian military reserved penicillin, so did the British military, for it reserved antibiotics for the military. And so the physician who was taking care of my mother in Toronto um, made a special request for a civilian release of penicillin. And my mom was one of the first two Canadians, civilians, to ever receive penicillin. And it changed the course of her life. So antibiotics are helpful and good when they are used correctly. Um, so here are some of the causes of this unbalanced microbiome. Antibiotics, diet, medication. Everybody I see is on a PPI. Do you know what PPIs are? Um, uh, Losec, Tecta, Pantoprazole, Omeprazole, Ansoprazole, all these stomach medications to cure stomach acid. It's probably one of the high, most highly prescribed medications that we have, and it destroys the microbiome. And yet, everybody wants them to control their heartburn and their reflux. Toxins, and we're going to come to talking about multiple toxins. Glyphosate, Roundup. Another very powerful antibiotic, and like I said the other day, we have put, I forget the number now, but I think it's like 58 billion kilograms of glyphosate on the planet Earth since 1975, okay? So it's just, it's in the rainwater right now. Um, antibacterial soaps. Fortunately, Canada has banned antibacterial soaps, and there's a a certain chemical in the antibacterial soaps called triclosan. And if you look on an antibacterial soap and you see triclosan on there, don't buy it. It's a very powerful GI disturbing antibacterial. And everything you go to the store is antibacterial because we become paranoid about bacteria. I normally put a slide in here, but I didn't put it in this time, and it's a picture of a little girl who's got mud in her hair. She's just covered with mud, and she's holding her little puppy, and they're all just covered with mud. And the, the, I put the caption on this picture, and it says, protect your child's immune system. Let them play in the mud. <laughs> but we got so that we, you know, parents will wash their children's hands and feet and everything five times. My son-in-law, he scrubs my grandkids to the point that I think their skin's going to come off. And, uh, and I'm concerned about their microbiomes. Um, beauty products. Do you know how many beauty products from shaving cream to colognes to makeups to creams to moisturizers we all use? Many of them disturb our microbiome. Stress disturbs it. And then we got the bottom one, sugar, sugar, sugar. So antibiotics and medications. Uh, oh my, that looks good. Sugar. <laughs> um, Roundup. Um, antibacterial soaps. Um, so how do we improve our... Uh, microbiome. Actually, before we get there, I'm just going to go through a couple more diseases that we feel are, are related. I mentioned obesity. Um, the, the microbiome disturbs our storage of fats and our expenditure of energy. Type 2 diabetes, I mentioned that one too. And um, after eating a meal that's rich in fats and certain substances which are contained in the, in the walls of bacteria, um, enter the bloodstream, they cause an inflammation, the inflammation causes high blood sugars, insulin resistance, so we're finding big factors there. Um, type 1 diabetes, also related to the microflora, the childhood diabetes. Um, inflammatory bowel disease, I've already mentioned that. Colon cancer, I mentioned that. Liver disease. 
Um, so what do we do? How do we take care of our microbiome? Well, the first thing is, um, as I mentioned, we try to avoid C-sections, we breastfeed our babies, we avoid antibiotics, but um, we avoid some of these other medications such as anti-inflammatories and these stomach medications. Another one is artificial sweeteners. Saccharin, um, sucralose, all these artificial sweeteners. Did you know that they discovered sucralose when they were researching insecticides? And they found out the insecticide was sweet, so they stick it in our food. Um, did you know that most salad dressings you buy in the store contain antifreeze? They're antifreeze. They're allowed to put up to so much in it as a preservative. Read the labels on your salad dressings you find in the store, and you will find ethylene, di ethylene glycol as one of, the, um, one of the ingredients in a salad dressing. So I suggest you make your own salad dressings and don't put antifreeze in it. Um, we're going to talk about Roundup a little bit more. It's, it's a real issue. And I was just telling Pastor Anthony yesterday that the way, one of the ways in which Roundup works, first of all, it's an antibiotic. It kills life. That's why it's an herbicide. Second of all, it puts holes in the intestinal tract of the insects that might eat the plants. But it's not supposed to hurt humans. Yeah. So Monsanto, and now Bayer, says. But it does. It punches holes in our intestinal tract. And then we get leaky gut syndrome. And so certain things are absorbed through these holes in our gut. And we get multiple allergies and all sorts of intestinal disturbances, largely based on this Roundup. And we now have in functional medicine tests that we can determine the amount of Roundup that accumulates in our bodies, and we sometimes have to detox people for the Roundup that they've had. So what do we do avoiding Roundup? Buy organic if we possibly can. Um, there are certain foods that are very, very highly Roundup used. Wheat, one of the reasons why you know, all the bread products we have, the Roundup is just used extensively with wheat. Corn is very widely used. We're now moving on for Roundup with rice. We're moving on with Roundup for other grains. Um, the farmers just spread it on their fields like it's fertilizer. Um, so buy organic if you can. Um, we can take probiotics, okay? Now probiotics, and I'll move my slide on. I think I have some probiotics on here. Probiotics are capsules of some bacteria that we can take. And if you have to take an antibiotic, I recommend that you do follow it up with some probiotics. And there are certain um, types that you can buy over the counter. One's called Align. And if you take these probiotics, they help replenish the good bacteria in your intestinal tract after an antibiotic. Very interesting, women who get frequent urinary tract infections, I tell them instead of taking antibiotics to put some probiotic capsules in the vaginal tract and it cures their repetitive urinary tract infection. Part of it is because we've used so many antibiotics. Um, so probiotics are the antibiotics we can replace. But we then have prebiotics, and that's the food that our healthy bacteria need to grow on. So the current recommendations are that in order to have a healthy microbiome, you need to eat 40 different plant-based foods per week. Now, that doesn't mean 40 servings. That means 40 different ones, okay? So this includes, before you get panic struck, this includes vegetables, fruits, seeds, nuts, herbs, spices, grains, all these, a collection of plant-based products. Now, do an experiment 
and start counting how many different plant-based foods you put in in your diet in a week. After I was at a conference on gut health, I decided to start counting. Well, I cheated because my first meal was at a Chinese restaurant. And I got 25 in the first meal because <laughs> the Chinese know how to eat well. But you know, the average Canadian gets five. That comes from the tomato, the lettuce, on the hamburger bun, which is wheat, and maybe the onion or the pickle. But most of the young people I see take off the lettuce, take off the tomatoes, take off the pickle, and they eat just the hamburger, okay? So they don't get any. Um, 40 different ones. Do your count. The first 25 are easy, okay? But it's the last 15 that are hard. So what you got to do is you got to, when you go to the grocery store and you see some fruit or vegetable that you've never seen before, you need to come home, find out what it is, find out how to use it, find out how to eat it, okay? So uh, if you live in Mexico, you have jicama, which is a, a very interesting root vegetable, you know? Uh, certainly, if you see some of the tropical fruits, which I grew up on and enjoy from mangoes and papayas, um, if you go to Southeast Asia, you've got rambutan and um, lychees and uh, mangosteen and um, come from the Caribbean, you've got breadfruit and other things there. But, just expand your parameters instead of always buying peas and carrots. You know, I have, I have family members who say they're vegetarian, but they haven't eaten a vegetable in years. All they eat is pasta and bread. Um, so expand your sources, okay? 40 different plant-based foods in a week. Another aspect is fermented foods. And this is very, very important because these fermented foods contain multiple beneficial bacteria. So the most common fermented foods, for me as a German, it's sauerkraut, okay, soured cabbage, fermented cabbage. If you're a Korean, your sauerkraut is called kimchi. And um, if you live with Koreans, that smells pretty bad sometimes, and you, you don't want them storing their kimchi in the, in the fridge. But there's some other ones too. Um, yogurt is a fermented food, but it's not rich in anti, in, um, in prebio probiotics, but kefir is. Are you familiar with kefir? It's a liquid yogurt um, that's usually, it's very good, okay? And you can use it as a drink. Um, we've got fresh cream, sour cream, um, Worcestershire sauce, kombucha. Kombucha is a fermented tea, usually a green tea. And um, it's available everywhere now in Canada. And um, it does have a very small amount of caffeine in it. And sometimes it has a very small amount of alcohol. But I would not worry about the alcohol or the caffeine. Um, it's, um, it's just a very good fermented food. Um, kimchi, I mentioned that one. Miso, which is a fermented soybean that the Japanese use. Um, tempeh is a fermented soybean product as well. Um, a lassi, an oh, if I go to an Indian restaurant, I want to get a mango lassi, okay, because it's made with some good fermented yogurt and mangoes. So try to include some fermented foods in your diet every week. Um, we need to add fiber to our diet as well because the fiber is, um, is what these bacteria grow on and they feed on. Um, avoid antibiotics, I've mentioned that. Avoid other medications. Avoid glyphosate as much as possible. So, now we've talked about prebiotics, which are the plant-based foods. We've talked about probiotics, which are the bacteria that we can replace, but now we've got postbiotics. And postbiotics are the gases that are produced by these bacteria in our gut. And we may think that a little bit of gaseousness is kind of embarrassing and bad, but these gases communicate with our brain. And they are what communicate and send all sorts of messages to make our brains healthy. So, um, the gut-brain connection. These two are intimately connected. There are links between our bellies and our brains. 
The intestinal tract contains a very dense concentration of nerve cells. That's why some of us call the gut our second brain. Um, and they regulate various aspects with our, with our digestion. So in our complementary nervous system, there are between 200 and 500 million nerve cells, and they produce neurotransmitters, which are necessary for our mood stabilization. Um, they act as messengers between various parts of our nervous system. Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, so these neurotransmitters are like serotonin, um, norepinephrine, noradrenaline. Did you know that 95% of our serotonin is made on intestinal tract and not in our brain? That was astounding news when I learned that. So, the gut impacts the brain, the brain impacts the gut. So serotonin is frequently called the happy hormone. It's what makes us, our mood stabilized. Another one is nitrous oxide, dopamine, the motivation hormone. These are produced by our intestinal tract. So the link between the intestinal tract and the brain is just a very powerful aspect for brain health. Um, a person can be, a person who is stressed frequently can have many different infectious diseases. Um, even heart disease and various brain diseases. Who would have ever thought that depression could find its cause in an intestinal tract? However, we now know that 400 times more messages come from the bacteria in our intestinal tract to the brain than in the other direction. So many things can influence our microflora. One thing I've just discovered recently about 15 years ago, I was in the Congo, and I suddenly got a toothache, or I thought. I thought, oh my, I've got a cavity. So as soon as I got home, I went to see my dentist. He said, no, you don't have a cavity. He said, I think you're coming down with shingles. I said, shingles? He said, yeah, I think it's a nerve that's irritated. Well, I had no signs of shingles. I watched for it. It never developed. But I developed a neuralgia in my face that was very intensive. Every bite I took just would send shooting pain up into my eye. Uh, I thought it was related to a crown that I had on a tooth. The dentist said, no, it is not related to that. So... I was at a conference, a functional medicine conference, and I saw a practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine, and he tested me and said, I think it's your toothpaste. I said, my toothpaste? Yeah, my toothpaste. He said, I think that's what it is. Well, I checked with my daughters, who are functional medicine people, and they said, well, I think it is your toothpaste. So a dentist friend of mine suggested I switch brands of toothpaste, which I did. Nothing happened. Still, pain. Even shaving or touching my lip would just, oh, just send this neuralgia right up. For 15 years, I put up with that neuralgia until I decided I was going to go with a toothpaste that did not have fluoride in it. And I have been miraculously cured. Not a twinge of it. Fluoride and chlorine are very powerful disturbances of our body. But we have fluoride in our water systems. We have chlorine in our water systems. They're part of our community public health measures. I, go to my, I just got back from my daughter's place out on the West Coast, and to take a bath smelled like I was in a swimming pool. Um, these halogens, chlorine fluoride, are poisons. And... Um, but what do we do about them? They're, it's hard to avoid them. 
if, you have, if you're fortunate enough to have well water, which we are, we, we do avoid it. But if you live in the city, you can't always avoid it. But the less chlorine we take. We hired a lady to come and help my wife with some cleaning one time, and she would go through a bottle of Javex every week. We go through a bottle of Javex every 25 years in our house. And we said, I'll go through that in a week. You use Javex on everything. It's chlorine. Okay? So decrease the amount of chlorine that you, that you use too. Um, many of these chemicals do affect us. And they even affect our genetic material with epigenetic influences. And we can pass that on to the next generation. So, in summary about this stuff, we have been taught the bacteria are our enemy and the cause of disease, but we've got to change our paradigm. And we've got to recognize that the bacteria in our microbiome has but one goal, that's to keep us alive and healthy and well. Our internal ecosystem is essential for our health and well-being. So the intestinal microbiome is like a tropical rainforest. It's highly structured. It's, com it's a complex ecosystem. And in review, the we upset the delicate balance by the standard Canadian diet, by highly processed foods, artificial sweeteners, food additives, artificial colors, artificial flavors, glyphosate, sugar, did you know what the biggest addictive compound is in Canada? It's not crystal meth. It's sugar. And you, you have a meal with some sugar in it, and you'll find you're craving sugar very, very quickly. Sugar is a powerful addiction. And there are some people who, recommend, who, who suggest that sugar is even more powerful than some of the other opioids in, in, as far as an addiction. So, and of course, we in Canada, we eat just enormous amounts of sugar. Um, so then we have a problem with our intestinal barrier. And we talked about glyphosate punching holes in this. But here are some other things that do punch holes in our intestinal barrier. Intestinal protection area. Dairy products can because the animals are fed what? Antibiotics. The animals in commercially prepared animal feedlots are fed abnormal type of foods. They're force-fed grains instead of grass. They... Um, they're frequently, they're exposed to glyphosate. Gluten is, can punch holes in our gut, too. Soy can punch holes in our gut, and that makes it especially difficult for people who want to be vegetarian and eat gluten and soy. Um, so these are some other areas. Gluten is damaging to many intestinal tracts, and it, you know, we have used grains as part of our basic staple foods, but it was not initially that way. And if I look from a, a Genesis perspective at it, what were Adam and Eve given to eat? Stalks, leaves, roots, fruit, vegetables, plants growing, you know, they were not given grains to eat, okay? Um, if you look in an evolutionary perspective, what do the apes eat? Gorillas. Plant leaves, stalks, and roots. What are the chimpanzee? The chimpanzee is the most difficult because the chimpanzee will eat other creatures, okay? It'll eat mice and rats and a few things. But an orangutan won't. They all eat leaves, stalks, and roots. So grains have to be cooked in order to be eaten. You got to bake them or you got to, you know, you turn them into flour and bake them. So grains came into the diet as a famine protection mechanism because you can store them for a long time. And so we've come to use grains very liberally with their gluten in them. Now, in Rwanda and the Congo, the 
The famine protection foods are cassava, because you can leave it in the ground for a long period of time. And so therefore, most people, most people who are subsistence farmers there will keep a fairly good stock of cassava available so that if the drought comes, they have something to eat. Um, other places will use taro or um, the Hawaiians call it poi. Um, other types of roots and tubers that will be used pr to, for drought protection. But we, in, starting with the Middle East, the Fertile Crescent have developed grains. So we usually keep grains as our drought and famine prevention food. But there are some problems with it. OK. Um, let me just go on here with, um, if our gut is weakened by a diet, weakened nutrition, too much sugar, too little fiber, deficiencies in magnesium, zinc, omega-3s, the abuse of antibiotics and hormones in our food, mental and physical stress, exposure to toxins, we develop a permeable gut, and this is the cause of allergies, inflammations, and broken brains. Um, as far as healthy fats are concerned, our brains are made of fats, so we need fats that are rich in omega-3s. Now, omega-3s are found in, wonder of wonders, leaves, stalks, and roots of plants. We don't find them in the grains of plants. Those are omega-6s. So what have we done in our society? What do we feed our cattle now? Instead of letting them feed on grass, we feed them grain. When we farm fish for, say, farm salmon, we feed them grains. So the salmon that you buy that's farmed is rich in omega-6, poor in omega-3. The beef that has been raised in a feedlot has very little omega-3 and rich in omega-6s. Normally, we need a two-to-one ratio between omega-6 and omega-3, and in the typical Canadian diet, we're at 25 to 30 to 1 with omega-6s. So omega-3s are important, and they're found in nuts. So every day, we try to have a little handful of a variety of different nuts. An almond or two, a walnut, a pecan, a pistachio, a Brazil nut, a hazelnut, and... Um, that small amount of nuts provides healthy fats for us. And we're going to see when we get towards the end of our series the role that Brazil nuts play because they have a very special role in, in playing. Avocados are excellent fats too. Difficult to find here in Canada. I just bought some today at the store. They're expensive. But the, the fats in avocado are very, very good. When we first moved to Rwanda, we had an avocado tree in our backyard, the trunk of which was so big we couldn't get our arms around it. It produced avocados 365 days a year. It was one of the only trees that did, because normally avocados have a season. And the biggest avocado that we got off that tree was 60 centimeters in, dia in, in circumference. It was big like this. And when we first arrived, it was dry season, and all we had to eat was avocados. And we ate avocados until we were so tired of avocados that my oldest son still can't look one in the face. But the rest of us have learned to like them. So avocados give us a good fat. Um, olive oil, especially extra virgin, unprocessed olive oil is very good. And we'll look at some of these other things um, too. We should be um, having high quality fats. Um, and our food should not be overly refined. The more we refine them, the less food value that we have in them. So remember that two-thirds of our immune system is found in our guts. When our stomachs become inflamed, our brain becomes inflamed, we get immune system issues, and our microbiota gets um, disturbed. Um, let me just see here. The abnormal reactions to food which can unbalance our brain are inflammations. We have peptides which block the neurotransmitters in the brain and excitotoxins which stimulate the production of glutamate and kills brain cells. The biggest excitotoxin that we have in our food is MSG. 
And um, MSG is a significant damager of our brain. Now, you have to read the labels to avoid MSG, especially if you like Doritos or some of the flavored potato chips. They're loaded with MSG. So read the labels. And if it has MSG in, don't buy it, OK? You go to a Chinese restaurant, and I love Chinese food, but ask them if there's MSG in their food. And if there is MSG in their food, don't buy it. It is a chemical which is very brain destructive. Um, and it kills brain cells, too. Inflammation, the root of most diseases. So inflammation is the reaction of the body to an injury or an invasion of disease-causing germs and toxins. And the source of inflammation is, is frequently um, in the food that we eat or damage to our microbiome. Now, as I was giving a talk a few years ago, I just got back from India, and um, I realized, I learned that the five best natural anti-inflammatories are turmeric, cinnamon, ginger, cayenne, and sage. Well, I just got back from India where everybody eats curry. And so I quickly said to my wife, who was in the audience, I said, you know what? We had a lot of curry when we were in India. It's full of turmeric. What is the incidence of dementia in India compared to what it is in Canada? 10% of what we have. Wow. The amount of inflammation is significantly reduced. So once again, diet plays a role with some of this. So we re reduce inflammation by changing our diets and eating a variety of different colored foods. Yes? The five? Turmeric. OK? Ginger. And I'm going to do it in order of effectiveness. So turmeric's the best. Ginger number two. Cinnamon number three. Cayenne pepper number four. And sage number five. And these are very good. So we try to put turmeric in as many things as we possibly can in our diets to help us with arthritic pains and inflammations and all the other inflammations. And we will talk more about that. But those are the basic um, anti-inflammatories. So we need to change our diet. We need to eat foods of a variety of colors. And that doesn't mean Skittles and M&Ms. Uh, Every single color of food, whether it's purple food or orange food or green food, is, gives you a different protective, a different antioxidant. Did you know that carrots were originally purple? And somebody one day bred an orange carrot, and everybody liked it. So they changed, and they changed carrots, so now they're orange. We buy purple carrots, too. So we plant some orange ones and some purple ones. Did you know there are purple green beans? Well, they're not green, they're purple beans, okay? But they're, yeah. So we plant yellow beans, green beans, and purple beans. Now, when you cook a purple bean, it turns green. But still, the coloring, the pigment in it is there, and we need it for our health. We also found out that white vegetable foods, such as cauliflower, or turnip or rutabaga, or a parsnip has certain microchemicals in it that are very important for our health and maintain the health of our brain. So foods of different colors. Um, so here are some diseases caused by inflammation. And you can see the list of them. They're enormous. It's the basic cause of disease. So how do we reduce inflammation? Eliminate the cause, change our diets, plant-based foods of a variety of color. But then we have the question of toxins. And we're just exposed to all these toxins. We've already mentioned them, and I won't belay the point. 10% of the water supply in Canada has arsenic in it. Um, beauty products, shaving cream, lotion, sunscreen, all chemical products. DDT is still in our soil, even though it's been banned for 50 years. Food which is stored in plastic containers. 
develops toxins in there. And we buy water bottles that are plastic. And they're not only plastic, but they're the cheapest plastic imaginable. And they leach chemicals into the water. So when I travel to Malaysia, every street corner has a, has a, water, has a water distributor. And you just put your water container underneath. You put in one, uh, one ringgit, and you get, your, you get water. We need to be expanding the way we distribute water instead of, I see people coming out of the grocery store with cases of plastic bottles of water. Get a water filter, a Brita. Um, do something so that you don't have to buy water. Um, We talked about the abuse of medications, um, anti-inflammatory medications, and of course our stress level that we talked about. In order to have a balanced brain, we need to do many of these things. We need to eat better. We need to avoid the toxins in our environment. And some of this takes work. It takes reading labels. It takes doing a little bit of research. So what we've tried to do now for our breakfast in the morning is we do a vegetable smoothie for breakfast. And we take as many different vegetables out of our garden as we possibly can. We mix in some, oh, flaxseed. We'll put a few nuts in. We'll put um, some hemp heart seed. We'll put some spirulina, which just comes from a seaweed. We put as much of that in. And in our breakfast smoothie in the morning, we get 20 to 25 different plant-based foods. And especially if we add a, few, a little bit of turmeric in it and a little bit of ginger in it. And we might put a little bit of an apple. I prefer if it isn't too sweet, so I prefer it to be savory. And uh, yeah, we get a lot of vegetables in the morning. Antioxidants. So um, yeah, let's, um, let's look at how we can improve these things and improve our bioflora so that we can have healthier brains. Um, a couple other slides here, and then I'll move on to part two. 10% of our water supplies in Canada have excessive levels of arsenic and lead. Um, beauty products, um, all made from chemicals. Um, DDT remains in the soil even after being banned for many years. Plastic containers for our food. We absorb toxins from the plastics. We have medications which are psychoactive and unbalance our brains. We have the abuse of antidepressant medication. We have protein pump inhibitors. All these stomach medications which disturb our bioflora. And we have, ooh, yikes, stress. Okay. So. Any questions about the gut brain for? I've given you a lot of information um, and perhaps too much information for tonight, but we'll have some more time to review it before the week is over. Any questions? Yes. Is what? I don't know what that is. It's, oh. it's frozen. Yeah, so it must be the same as miso or tempeh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sure, and that's good, yeah. Someone else? Yes. Coconut oil is good, providing it's not ultra-processed. Okay? Now, it is an oil which is solid at room temperature, or more solid. So I would use it somewhat in, in moderation, um, because solid oils turn into solid oils in our body and they're involved with our heart disease, okay? So we're better off with a liquid oil. Um, some of the other oils that we use that are very good are avocado oil, grapeseed oil. Um, they're also very good in omega-3s and, um, and they're healthy oils, yeah. You, you were talking about um, avoiding antacids, or at least the Zantex of the world. Um, would that apply to Rolaids and those kinds of over-the-counter antacids? 
Um, the problem, it's different with those. Okay. The problem with the over-the-counter acids is the aluminum that's put in them. So you have to read the labels again. Gaviscon is one of the best over-the-counter antiacids in Canada. But if you buy Gaviscon in the United States, it has aluminum in it. Rolades and Tums, you have to read the labels. Some of them will have aluminum in it. And we do not need that metal in our body. Okay? There has been concern that the aluminum is related to brain inflammation and dementia. Okay? It's not totally proven yet, but um, I don't particularly want to be eating any more aluminum than I absolutely have to. Now, we still use aluminum foil okay, for covering foods and items, but um, the other areas with aluminum comes in antiperspirants. Yes. And, and, you know, anti so, personally, I never buy an antiperspirant. I will only buy a deodorant. Difficult to find because the antiperspirants have a variety of metals in them to block our sweat, and it's, they're not healthy. So I try to use a pure deodorant rather than an antiperspirant deodorant. But it's the aluminum in Tums and Rolades that I get concerned about. Read the labels. Okay. Any others? Yep. I recently attended a... Um a course or a seminar by, by a naturopath, and mm -hmm. he said that um, fermented foods were not good for us. And he talked about sauerkraut, and he said it interferes with the um, stomach acids, and that. No, it's disagree not with him, totally disagree. Okay. And I would, um, the, the, the role of the fermented foods is they're providing probiotics, they're, pro they're enhancing our, the bacteria in our bioflora and our gut. Um, I find no evidence of any disturbance to our intestinal tract with it. Now, I, it, that having been said, you don't need a diet that's just fermented foods, okay? What I was suggesting is you have some fermented foods two or three times a week, okay? So, so uh, I, you know, I can re-research that out, but I don't necessarily agree with that perspective. So, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna, con one more? One more. Yep. Um, you were talking about uh, the role of, say, antibacterial soaps. Um, what about, you know, in the last two years, we have been using a lot of hand sanitizers. Has that at all been any impact on people's overall health in terms of the, the biome? Or Absolutely. I, okay. I rarely use the, uh, the hand sanitizers. Mm -hmm. it came, they came out with, um, with it at the beginning of the COVID pandemic because we weren't sure how COVID was transmitted, okay? So we thought that it was going to be transmitted by touch. And so if you remember right, Dr. Fauci in the United States and um, Dr. Tam here in Canada were saying that we needed to um, sanitize and not touch our eyes and not touch your mouth and, you know, do all this sort of stuff. But very rapidly on into the COVID pandemic, we discovered that it is aerosol transmitted, okay? So the entire emphasis on hand sanitizers decreased, despite the fact that we all have them in every store we go into. We have them on the table here in the church. We have, you know, we have them everywhere. Um, I don't use hand sanitizers very often. Um, I may if I don't have a chance to wash my hands. Um, I think that the better advice would be to avoid keeping our hands in our mouths and eyes and mucous membranes, but that's a general it's not a COVID necessarily related. It just keeps us from getting contaminated. The story I'll tell you about that is I, w I used to work for Holland America on the cruise ships. And um, one ship that I was on on the Alaska run, there was a man there who wore these beautiful white gloves. And I saw him everywhere he went with white gloves. And so I got after the cruise contract was over. I was in the airport in Vancouver. And I saw the man in a shop. So I said to the man, excuse me, sir, but I was the doctor on the ship. And um, I just noticed that you were always wearing white gloves. He said to me, did you see me in the clinic? I said, no, as a matter of fact, I didn't. That's why I'm asking you here in the bookshop. He said, that's why I'm wearing the white gloves. He said, I love to cruise. And every time I cruised, within 48 hours of getting on the ship, I was sick. Well, cruise ships have 3,000 people on board, okay? You can be guaranteed that 150 of them have an upper respiratory infection. They're coughing, sneezing, you know, with a cold or, you know, whatever. 
and you got handrails, you got doorknobs, you go to the buffet, and everyone's handling the same utensils. He said, I was sick every cruise I made until I started wearing gloves. I've never been sick once. So there is some benefit from keeping our hands clean, but, and of course the hand sanitizers, we're not putting them all over our whole body, but there is a benefit from the bacteria that are in our hands. Yeah. So, long answer. I guess because some people would use hand sanitizer and just eat, right? Instead of washing in yeah. between. And I so I prefer, I prefer just washing. Yeah. And um, so in the clinic, during the height of the pandemic, I would use Lysol and clean off all the tables and chairs after every person was in an exam room. But once we, discerned, once we discovered that it was not contact spread, I stopped doing it because the less of that I use, the better. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to part two, the freedom to love. Um, so... I have a quotation here, which is in French. Some of you perhaps read French, but um, it says, the freedom to love is no less sacred than the freedom to think. Victor Hugo. Um, the universe was created with certain design laws, the way things function. And so one of the design laws that we have is gravity. If I step off this step here, I'm going to hit the ground. If I step off the balcony of a first floor apartment, I'm going to hurt myself. If I step off the balcony from the 18th floor, I'm probably going to kill myself. Is gravity punishing me for breaking the rules? No, it's just the way the universe is made. And we have to respect the laws of the universe in order to um, live healthfully and happily. So we also have the law of thermodynamics. And one of the laws in thermodynamics says that left on its own, everything goes to a state of randomness and energy is constant in the universe and everything is sort of on this process. These are some of Einstein's laws. It's a law, a design law, but we also have the law of love, other-centered love. And so as long as we live within this other-centered love, things are going to go better than if we live outside of that law. Now, love cannot exist unless there is complete freedom. Supposing that you have a friend and you really appreciate this friendship and so you say, I don't want you to see anybody else. I don't want you to visit with anybody else. I want you to spend only your time with me. In fact, I'm going to lock you in a room so you can only be with me. Is love going to increase? No, it's going to become very oppressive and decrease. So love requires complete freedom. And um, if freedom is removed, love is damaged and finally destroyed. And a desire to rebel develops in the heart. You can imagine what this person, this friend of yours would do if you locked them in a room and said, you can only associate with me. They would become rebellious and try to get out of there. So um, love requires this complete freedom. And if we choose to remain in a situation without freedom, love will be destroyed and we will destroy ourselves. This is not an imposed law. This is a design law. It's how the universe is made. The law of gravity and the law of love are design laws. Um, as I said, if a person is the victim of a controlling relationship and suddenly they're into a relationship of freedom, you just watch how they start to flourish, 
how their life starts to improve, their health improves, their well-being improves, joy appears, and happiness seems to predominate. And so the same thing is the opposite if a person's in a controlling relationship and suddenly, um, oh, I've already said that. Now we can understand that if the universe was designed with such a law, the creator also values our freedom. And this means that God will never violate the freedom, the law of freedom on which the universe was built. The principle is one of the arms that he uses against the lies of the enemy. I have a text here. It is true that we live in the world, but we do not fight from worldly motives. The weapons in our fight are not the world's weapons, which we use to destroy strongholds. We destroy false arguments and pull down every proud obstacle that is raised against the knowledge of God. We take every thought captive and make it obey Christ. And after you have proved your complete loyalty, we will be ready to punish any act of disloyalty. We're in a war of false ideas about our creator who is love personified. The conflict in the universe between good and evil, between love and fear, is which principle should dominate in the universe and at its origin. What is the truth about our God and about how the universe that he has made functions? As we discussed last yesterday, lies have been circulated about our God. The circle of trust has been broken. Fear has become a predominant factor which controls our minds, and a mind controlled by fear is a mind which is dying. If we accept the truth about the character of God as revealed by Jesus, the circle of life, love, and trust will be restored, and we will be healed and have life more abundantly. Yesterday, we talked about BN. Uh, BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor. It's the fertilizer which stimulates the growth and development of brain cells. If we want our prefrontal cortex to be strengthened so that it, control, it can control the fear center of the brain, the amygdala, then we need to know the truth about our God the circuits of the prefrontal cortex will be reinforced and the brain will become more balanced. In contrast, if we believe that God is demanding, controlling, punishing, vindictive, a God who demands faultless obedience under the penalty of death or worse yet, eternal torture, if we believe the lies that Satan has spread about our God and continues to spread even in our churches, we are going to stimulate the limbic system and the amygdala will be strengthened and fear will dominate our minds and BDNF will change the neural pathways and our brain becomes unbalanced. What does it mean to obey Christ? Oh, it means to accept all 28 fundamental beliefs and uphold them for... No, that's not what Jesus said. Let's look at what he said. Now I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. That's the commandment. Did you know that, that Christianity is really a, a religion about healthy relationships? It's not about what you eat and what you don't eat and what you wear and uh, whether you have pierced ears or not. Or It's about healthy relationships. The other day I was in a church and a man came in and he said, oh, I want to praise the Lord for this major spiritual breakthrough. And everybody said, oh, yes, what is it, what is it? And he said, well, I went into Dunkin' Donuts and I came out without a coffee. I gasped. 
I said to him, sir, it's not about what you came out with or without. It's about how you treated the girl behind the counter that matters. Because it's about relationships. And so we've gotten so sidetracked with what we teach and what we believe that we put up with mean, condemning, nasty people who follow all the rules and regulations and come to church on a regular basis and pay all the money that they believe. And we think that's good. We don't know what goes on in their home, how they beat their partners and cause all sorts of trouble. Christianity is a religion of healthy relationships, a healthy relationship with our creator and a healthy relationship with each other, including the nasty, miserable ones. It's not always easy. We must control our thoughts. Our thoughts must be other centered. And so as we talked about the other day, if we're struggling with some of these ideas and we're struggling with depression and fear and everything, one of the best things to do is to start looking for someone that we can help. We take our focus away from ourselves and on to someone else. Not always easy, but that near transition from self-centered to other-centered causes a transformation in our brains. Um, the prefrontal cortex then becomes the controlling center of the brain, just as it was created to be, and the fear center is subdued and will not malfunction and cause us to become fearful and stressed. Look at our next text. In conclusion, my brothers, and I will add, and sisters, fill your minds with those things that are good and that deserve praise, things that are true and noble, right, pure, lovely, and honorable. Put into practice what you have learned and received from me, both from my words and from my actions, says Paul, and the God who gives us peace will be with you. Traumatic experiences, hatred, death, abuse, torture, war, all these things have negative effects on our minds. Medical imaging shows clearly that an emotional trauma stimulates the limbic system and the amygdala. Have you heard of Dr. Amen? Dr. Amen is a very well-known neurophysiological physician in California who studies the brain. He does special imaging, PET scans of the brain. And he can see the areas that become inflamed in the brain. Now, normally here in Canada, we reserve PET scanning for cancer patients. But Dr. Amen does PET scanning on people who have experienced abuse, people who have been in a traumatic experience, people with PTSD, and he sees the areas that become inflamed in the brain, and it's astounding some of the research that he's coming up with. These traumatic events in our lives stimulate the limbic system, the amygdala, they become overloaded, congested, and the brain becomes unbalanced. The person has difficulty sleeping, they develop a bad mood, they have excessive muscular tension, headaches, migraine headaches, nightmares, and their body secretes stress hormones as a result. Cortisol, cytokines, inflammation cascade starts, and they develop a series of diseases. We call these PTSD. Traumatic, difficult, difficult, difficult. An understanding about the truth of our Creator and a complete, intimate trust in our gracious, loving God is essential in order to resist the changes that result from emotional trauma. We've all had emotional trauma. Every single one of us has, in varying degrees, some of us have had intense trauma in our lives, loss, <laughs> struggles, abuse. 
But the love of God can transform this and change this. And believe it or not, I think it's probably the only thing that can transform it in our lives. We can never force someone to love us. Imagine this if you said this to your children. You love me or I will punish you. Will that engender love? No, it's going to engender rebelliousness. Love has to be within a total, total evidence of freedom. Now, if I say to my child, if you don't love me, I will strap you. And the child will say, oh, yes, daddy, I love you, I love you, I love you. Will that change the heart? No. The heart will become that of a rebel. And as soon as they can get out from under my authority, they'll be gone. Love requires complete freedom. God will never win the war by force. If it was able to be won by force, it would have been won thousands of years ago. Because there's no doubt that God is stronger than the adversary. The text says that even the demons who know the force of God tremble at the thought of it. God will never win the war and correct the lack of trust or the lack of love by force. It's not possible. After September 11, churches were filled. But what was the reason? Was it love or was it fear? How long did that last before they started going empty again? Two weeks? Three weeks? Yeah, wait till it passes by. That's why God told us in the next text, Zechariah 4, 6, you will succeed not by military might nor by your own strength, but by my spirit. We can and we do put criminals in prison to control their behavior and protect others from their criminal activities. We can control their behavior by the force of the law, but we can never control their imagination or their thoughts. And my biggest complaint about the criminal justice system is we only make them worse by the incarceration we do for them. We never correct the fundamental problem that has created the criminality in the first place. If our thoughts are not changed, if our characters are not changed, we will not be changed. What is needed is a change of thought processes, a change of heart, which is found in this anterior cingulate cortex in order for the person to become changed. And that is why the teaching of forgiveness which is one of the central teachings of the Christian church, is not logical. Because supposing as a physician, I have a patient who comes in to see me with lung cancer because they've smoked for 50 years. And so I say to that patient, I forgive you for smoking. Is that going to be reassuring to the patient? They're still going to die of lung cancer. It's just that the doctor forgives them. The best words they can hear me say is, I can heal you of your cancer and make you well again. Now, if I had the habit of killing all my smoking patients, then forgiveness would be very important because they wouldn't have to be killed at my hand. You see what happens in the Christian perspective? If we have the thought that God kills sinners, then forgiveness becomes very important. But a forgiven murderer is still a murderer. We need for that person to be changed and to be no longer a murderer. So the goal is not just forgiveness. Although it's good and we need to know we're forgiven and we need to forgive others. But forgiveness alone does not change us. We need to be healed. And we need, because this disturbance in our brains is a life-threatening disease, left alone, 
We will all die. But God says, I can and I will heal you if you'll just let me and cooperate with me. So the lung cancer patient comes in and I say, I can heal you. He says, oh, thank you so much. What can I do to help you? Oh, I'm glad you asked. There are a few things you need to do. Let's stop smoking, first of all, okay? Let me help you with that. I know it's hard, but let me work with you, and we'll get you off the cigarettes. And then let me get you on a better diet so that you can fight this cancer yourself. And I may have to operate on you, and I may have to take out that cancer in your lung, and you'll have to work with me, and it'll be painful. But if I do it, I think I can cure you. Be the best news the patient could receive. And so it is in Christianity. Our God doesn't kill sinners. Sin kills sinners. But God can heal us from that sin if we'll just work with him. So you see, the importance of forgiveness is dependent on the character and behavior of our God. If we believe the lies that Satan has told us, the circle of trust is broken, We replace love and trust with fear and self-preservation. The result is degeneration, sickness, and death. We not only need to be forgiven, but we need to be healed. However, if we believe what we've been taught, that God is obliged in his justice to kill and torture his disobedient children who are already dying from the disease of sin, then forgiveness becomes very important. In summary, love is tied to freedom. In order to love We have to be free. And this freedom, this capacity to love, is necessary if our brains are going to be changed and balanced and put into health again. And so if we've talked about the negative aspects, but the positive aspects are this freedom to love, this focus on others, And as we do that, and as the love develops in our hearts, the fear disappears, healing occurs. The text we had yesterday, perfect love casts out all fear. That's the answer for it. And the goal that we have is to have life and life more abundantly And so we need to find ways to strengthen this brain that we have, to strengthen the gut-brain connection so that we have all the foods that we need so the brain can function well. We need to replace the limbic system control with the prefrontal cortex control. And then the healing process can start to take place. It's a major transition And we're going to see as we get on to, I read which night it was, one of these nights we're going to look at the two operating systems, that one of the systems leads to healing and restoration. The other one leads to degeneration and disease. And we're going to look at how this transition takes place. God has made each one of us with a capacity to heal, and he who is the source of life, will heal and can heal every single one of us who want to be healed and have healthy brain. And that's my prayer for us all tonight. Thank you. Any questions? Question time again. And they can be on either part, either part of our talk. Yes, I... Why can't we eat Doritos? Well, we can, but Doritos have MSG in them. And MSG is a chemical, and that chemical hurts our brains. That hurts our brains. So if we want to have some snacks, we need to find snacks that don't have MSG in them. Okay? What was that? I eat. Yeah, well, okay. (laughs) Maybe just have one Dorito then, okay? And if you're watching the Super Bowl, you know, when they advertise Doritos, everybody goes and buys them. But (laughs) So, 
look and see some of the potato chips, the ones that have flavor on them, some of them have MSG put in to enhance the flavor. So you're going to have to learn how to read the label and you get your mommy to help you read the label, okay? <laughs> Writing the MSG in Doritos, like what are the other names for MSG? Is it like maltodextrin and that kind of stuff? No, it's just monosodium glutamate. Okay. Now sometimes they do hide it. Okay. Sometimes they will hide it and call it um, flavor enhancers. Okay. okay. So you got to be a little bit savvy because they know that some of us, you know, are into the MSG issue. So yeah, they will occasionally trick you, but many times it's just listed monosodium glutamate. MSG, yep. Black pepper, good for you, or? I don't, black pepper is not a bad. It's, it's not as powerful of an anti-inflammatory as some of the other ones. Mm -hmm. But these spices and herbs that we have that add flavor to our food are also very rich. They all have micronutrients in them, which are beneficial. So, um, they, yeah, they're, they're part of the flavor plant-based foods that are there, and I have no issues with any of them if we use them in, you know, reasonable quantities and everything. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, it's been long. We've, we've, oh, yeah, oh, sure. Is it true that um, black pepper enhances the absor absorption of the curcumin in, uh, in turmeric? I don't know that. Oh, you haven't heard about it? No, that. I don't know that it had okay. enhances the absorption necessarily. A curcumin and turmeric are the same thing. One's French, one's English. No, the, the curcumin in the turmeric. Okay, so the curcumin in the turmeric. No, I don't know that. I will, I will check that out for you before tomorrow, okay? Um, what about, you, you talked about, you know, um, animals eating uh, grains instead of grass. So um, it, it's... The implication is better to eat, say, uh, beef cattle that's been fed with, that's grass-fed versus... If, if you grains. are going to eat meat, right. you should buy grass-fed, antibiotic-free mm -hmm. meat, preferably from a person who has raised the animals themselves, known what was done with them, has butchered them in a humane way, and um, that's what your best meat is, yes, by, by far, okay? The meat that we buy in the meat counter in the, in the store, have, for those of you who don't live, have never lived in Western Canada, you drive by these feedlots, they have 5,000 cows all in this muddy pile of manure that they are feeding grain to in a trough. They never get to run. They never get to do anything. And that's the food that we get. The same thing with chickens, OK? The chickens should be free-range chickens. If they are free-range, their eggs are healthier. You will see it when you break the egg that it's healthier. So yes, if you're going to eat these animal products, then have free-range, antibiotic-free, um, preservative-free. Now, I don't know if you've heard about the Burger King commercial that they did a few years ago when Burger King suddenly decided to go preservative-free, antibiotic-free. And so they did a commercial whereby they took a burger from Burger King with all the trimmings on it that had no preservatives in it, and they filmed it every day for 45 days until it turned into sludge. And uh, the, the, the advertisement didn't cost anything for them, but it was a major promoter of Burger King because they saw without preservatives, the meat just sort of deteriorated. But um, no, it, that's what your best product is, yes. And same thing goes with fish. When we get farmed fish, the farm fish are filled with lice and, and, and parasites. They're fed grains. They're not healthy. And yet, if you go in the store and you want to buy salmon that's wild, it's five times the price of the farm salmon. Yes? A&W has been one of the leaders 
for healthy food in the country. So their, their beef is grass-fed, antibiotic-free. Their eggs are free-range chickens, antibiotics-free. And so they have done well. And many of the other restaurants are starting to follow them. So you've got Burger King and McDonald's is even starting to follow them, believe it or not. So we're getting a healthier product that's being offered in some of these places, yes. And Well, if you're going to go to a fast food restaurant, you're better off with A&W than one that doesn't have that sort of stuff. That's right. And besides that, A&W now has, you know, plant-based um, Beyond Meat burgers, which are very tasty too, okay? <laughs> Good. Okay. So, thank you very much. Tomorrow night, our topic is going to be on depression and anxiety, and we're going to look at some of the causes of it. Um, I may get um, a testimony or two from some people as to their, their journey through these things. Randy's not able to be with me tonight. He wanted to share his testimony about his journey through depression, but he's had to go back to work in um, Newcastle for a few days. He'll be with me as we get towards the weekend again, and I'll let him share his story at that time. And... Uh, but we're going to look at anxiety and depression tomorrow night, okay? So, may God bless you all, and I want you all to remember tonight to just smile many times and preferably have a good laugh tonight before you go to bed, to just rele relax some of the stress. And um, tomorrow night, we're going to do a couple things to reduce anxiety, so we'll do our laughter therapy tomorrow night. How's that? Okay, I'll give you a little course in laughter therapy. <laughs> Have a wonderful night. God bless you all. May you be happy, healthy, and holy until we get again tomorrow, okay? <laughs>